Our next speaker is also backed by popular demand. And uh, next, uh, once he gets mic'd up there, we'll be moving on to uh, Sterling Liddell. He is the uh, Senior Vice President at Robel Bank Finance, uh, International Food and business, Agribusiness Research and Advisory Department. Sterling is an agricultural economist with strong experience in U.S. grains and oilseed production and markets. Before joining Robo Bank three years ago, he worked as a senior research and development analyst with the Iowa Farm Bureau Federation, where he managed the research department. During that time, Sterling also held an interest in an agricultural consultancy business that, among other things, focused on designing decision tools for clients in the animal protein sector to optimize food purchasing. Before joining the Farm Bureau, Sterling worked as an economist with Pioneer Hybrid International in Johnson, Iowa, and a, a production financial analyst for Smithfield Foods. Sterling has a Bachelor of Science from Utah State University with a dual major in agriculture and business. Additionally, he has earned a Master's of Business Administration, International Food Chain Management, Transatlantic degree, jointly awarded with the distinction by the Royal Agricultural College Sir Chester, UK. Sterling? Thank you very much. Well, let's see, thanks for that introduction. Um, we need to probably, George, remind me, we need to update that. Uh, uh, I've been with, with Robo Bank now for eight years. Instead of three, I think the first time I came here, I'd been there for three years. That shows you how long we've been coming here. And this is a great event for us. We, we really enjoy being able to be out and, and interact and, and have discussions. We look forward to this event every year. So I'm going to give you an overview of the economics that are kind of going into these markets. This is a really hot topic right now, and I'll talk a little bit about why. Uh, we see it as a hot topic both on the macroeconomic side, but then also on uh, the farming side and what's going on with, with the U.S. markets. So just to start off with, uh, let's, let's look at the state of the agricultural or, or, or of the economy in general. First of all, just to give us an overview of how markets are, are coming together and competing, look at exchange rates. A lot of times people look at indexes, dollar indexes, but those are somewhat misleading. Usually the indexes are very heavily weighted towards the euro, and we just don't do enough trade with the euro to be able to, to make that uh, value. So we look at an agricultural index. And usually included in that is Japan, Mexico, Canada, South America, uh, Brazil, and Argentina. So looking at this, <clears throat> at where we are from an exchange rate perspective, the U.S. dollar has been gaining strength over the last few years. The other economies are also strengthening, but not quite at the same pace that U.S. dollar is. What that's doing is giving uh, the U.S., or strengthening the U.S. dollar and giving competitor countries some advantage in exports when they have them available especially on the major crops like corn and soybeans. The thing that's interesting in this process is we've seen Japan um, strengthen relatively well. If you can see on the, the chart, uh, we've also seen Mexico strengthen. And Mexico is very quickly becoming our number one customer of U.S. agricultural products. They are now number one in pork. They're moving very strongly in poultry. Um, we s sell a lot of corn, soybean meal, and wheat to Mexico. So it's a very important part of our, of our client base. If we look at um, what that means in the future, trade is extremely important, especially in the North American bloc. Mexico's economy is going forward, and we expect that they're going to uh, increase their consumption of the key, uh, the key exports from the United States uh, fairly strongly over the next five years in order to keep the U.S. economy, uh, agricultural economy, healthy and moving forward. The other thing interesting in Mexico, so as you see, the exchange rates have been moving very, 
very strongly against the dollar from a trade perspective. Last year, February and January, were pretty strong movements against the Mexican peso. But it was also one of the strongest exports months we had had to Mexico. So Mexico's starting to buy uh, food inelastically. In other words, they're able to have enough disposable income to continue buying from the United States even when the currency isn't favorable. So it's very important that all these economies are moving forward. So this is probably one of the most important slides or discussions to have right now. And it's just like most economists, we like to put a lot of squiggly lines on paper so that we have to interpret it. It's called job security. <laughs> when we look at what's happening in the US economy, and you've probably heard this in the last, in the last year, a new record. Dow Jones set a new record today. S&P 500 set a new record. 86 times or something like that, we set a new record last year in one of the trades, or one of the markets. So it's this incredible movement of the markets. This actually extends back a little bit further. This bull market, uh, as we call it, goes back to about 2012. That blue line is the S&P 500 base index. That gives us an idea of what's happening in investments in this industrial complex. You can see that that's going forward very strongly and has had strong growth rates over the last several years. Not to mention this past year, which has also been very strong. We've had occasional breaks in that, but it's going forward. Now the rate at which this is going forward is unprecedented. We had the fastest 1,000 point period in history over the last four weeks. There's a lot of money flowing into these markets. Right now, uh, the American Association of Individual Investors estimates that 72% of individual investors' portfolios are securities right now. And we're seeing billions of dollars a week flowing into high-risk debt assets. These are signs that this economy is moving forward and people are comfortable investing in the economy. That's driving the securities to very high levels. In fact, right now we have stocks that are trading at um, six times their book value, which is a very big gap. And now the other thing to watch here are the agricultural commodities and the precious metals. The, the gray line is silver, and the, the orange line is corn price, the price of a contract. You can see over that same period as we've been driving, really driving up these um, stock market and uh, securities markets, the commodities market and the solid safe asset investment has remained relatively stable. So there's a gap widening between the valuation of securities and the valuation of these hard and in difficult times considered safe assets. So what does that mean? Most people say, well, that means that there's a collapse coming. And there probably is some sort of a major correction that's out there. But in the, that's right now, as we look at this market, all the key indicators are that there's, there's really not a top in sight yet. In fact, we may not have even entered into the euphoric part of the cyclical, cycle, uh, cyclical move where you get even more movement. We may see some correction. It's not uncommon to see a 10-point or a double-digit correction in these markets, but it could continue on sometime into this year, maybe even for the full year. It's hard to exactly pinpoint that. That's the part that's difficult, but key indicators like the transportation industry. When the economy is doing well, transportation does well, FedEx, UPS, things like that do well. Um, the construction industry, um, Caterpillar, others, John Deere, as a matter of fact, 
do well in those, are doing well in this environment. That means the economy has some underlying legs. Of the 1820 indicators that uh, we generally watch, and that I watch personally, there's probably two that have shown any sign of, of movement. Co uh, contrast that with the dot-com bubble, there were about 17 of the 18 that were red. The one thing that is red is called the relative strength index. That tells us how strong uh, trends are and how persistent they are. When it gets over 70 on the index, we call it overbought. Anyone know what the RSI is now? 86. 86 compares to 1998 at the dot, height of the dot-com bubble. So that's one thing that starts to throw some caution, but everything else is, gives us a, an idea that there's going to be more investment here. Now, why is this important for agriculture, especially for commodities that are traded on, on exchanges? Because as we drive up, if there's any challenge or chink in the armor of these markets, you're likely to see quick movements by the investors out of those securities funds into commodities. And it generates very quick pricing opportunities. We've seen it twice in the, in the last couple of years, at least in corn and soybeans, where investors, for very weak fundamental reasons, jumped onto commodities, drove the prices up for a couple of weeks to very good levels, and then almost as instantly backed out, took profits and drove prices back down. So from this sets up that environment that becomes very ionized so that you can market, but you've got to be quick, you've got to be agile, and you've got to be ready to make decisions if you're going to price. Um, so let's go over just quickly the farm, uh, the farm economics and, and what we see out there. It, it um, admittedly has been very difficult the last few years for row crop farmers in the United States. It's been a tough period of time. Prices have dropped for much of the, the time below break-evens and left uh, most to try and figure out how to get by without strong uh, commodity prices. This has degraded some of the balance sheet assets of farmers, particularly the um, uh, asset ratios, debt to asset ratios deteriorating. I have to understand that in most of agriculture, the liquidity is now debt. Debt is the main source of liquidity in agriculture. Now, the fact that there's a lot of investment in high risk debt means that we may be building some bubbles into that bull market that I just showed you. And, and we can point to a few of those. I don't have time now. But there are some that are starting to become obvious. And at some point, that'll come apart. What happens when a market comes apart? Everyone turns to the safe haven. And right now, I've even read it in several investors, um, in, investor uh, newsletters. What are they saying the secret is to survival? Agricultural land. That's where you're safest, a lot of them are saying. That's where you're going to be safest long term. So that will help to arrest some of the value of agricultural land deteriorating as we see movement between the, those, these values. Um, the cost of debt will increase. The Federal Reserve will increase interest rates, depending on how fast they do it, uh, will we'll kind of determine how much we're going to invest in that bull market yet to come. So because it's been difficult, what's the definition of a bottom? Well, basically, this is kind of economic speak. Economic, an economic bottom is where you can no longer function. You no longer have the, the liquidity to function. And recovery is where everything makes an adjustment so that you can either adjust your own operation or the market is going to make an adjustment by attrition. In other words, farmers leaving and acres contracting or moving to other uses to be able to drive prices back up. Um, those that have survived well have been ma managing this operation or managing this all the way through, understanding their acres, um, knowing how to balance equipment costs across 
uh, their production. That's very critical, especially right now. Liquidate, liquidating non-core assets uh, and then exploring alternatives. This is key. How do you become less of a of a retail buyer and a wholesaler mark, wholesale marketer. That's almost absurd. We buy at retail, we sell at wholesale. Okay, how do you, that, that's not very many industries that do that. How do you move beyond that box? So let me just quickly go over this, a few sectors and point out some key things. I really appreciate what Jesse said. We, we, um, have a long-term uh, model that we use to balance equilibrium going out about 10 years. And we see a decline in total acres as being necessary over the next year years, albeit at a slow pace, but in order to meet that equilibrium with the increasing yields, we simply right now don't need as many acres. And we need to see some decline. Now that can happen in several ways. It can happen through the management and understanding what acres are most productive and should be farmed, uh, and it can also happen by uh, bankruptcy and being forced out in a market where debt is the key, the key liquidity. But the solid management hopefully will lead us to that process where we're, we're most efficient with the acreage we use. Soybeans right now have the biggest advantage. Uh, chickens, but also pigs are key uh, in consuming soybeans, and pork has really jumped the last several years in U.S. consumption. In fact, all the meats starting in 2014 have had phenomenal increases in U.S. consumption per capita. And that's really where our future is tied as row crop industry is to the animal protein industry. Cattle, for the first time, will sustain over a 10% export of production. And we'll have to get to 11 and 12% in order to maintain the current herds being built, back to about 32 million head of producing females. So we've got to see increasing exports, but we continue to see increasing uh, consumption as well. Soybeans are also losing protein on a steady pace. That means that more meal has to be fed, and it's still the most efficient feed, so it will be fed, which means additional demand for soybeans. Um, we'll, we'll continue to see that trend moving forward. Wheat is really a different story, but I'll get to that in just one second. Very quickly, one more point about corn and how it's setting up. So, because this will, this will affect the whole market. When we look at a pricing curve. So this is looking at the stocks divided by usage versus the price for corn. Uh, when we look at that for July, this is the J July CBOT contract for corn. It's developed a very nice relationship uh, between the two levels. And it, it looks about the way we would expect it to with an inflection point where the market gets very nervous that there's not enough stocks, and then a point on the line where the market says there's plenty of stocks, we're just going to bid this out in a long, slow, wait and see mentality. As we look at that for this year, where that red dot is, that is where prices for corn currently are sitting relative to the July contract. Now remember, We've got six months of this investment. We haven't seen the euphoric phase yet, probably in this bull market. If we see that in the next few months, we get to July, where corn is currently positioning is on the low end of where we would expect its volatility to be. If you get some challenge with crop prices or crop planting, probably going to see opportunities to market and to price. And if you're quick and you're, you're following it and you're good at getting there, you will probably have an opportunity to hit those prices. Whether they last a long time or not, at least get good at marketing as much of the crop as you need to to be able to, to pay uh, debts. Um, wheat, very quickly, is 
kind of changing some of its fundamentals. Most of the global wheat stocks now reside in China. If you look at the blue line, that's Chinese wheat stocks. The, the orange line are, you, are world wheat stocks, pretty flat. China's been, again, stockpiling grain. So this is where a lot of the wheat stocks reside. But in the US, there's plenty. There's plenty of wheat if we look at stocks to use in the US. Now it's come off a little bit, but it's still fairly high. But it's really a story of class. And I'll talk about class, uh, wheat classes in just a second. The key, the key thing here is that if you look at how that orange line and that gray line come together, at the end of the year, if we see the off-farm storage bid all the way down to the on-farm storage, it means that you're going to get good, better prices. If the, the market does not bid those off-farm storage out of the, out of the farm, or if the off-farm storage doesn't bid it out of the farm, then you have generally softer prices. Okay, because we're not we're moving it all from the farm. The last three years, we have not bid all of the grain, all of the wheat off the farms. So we're, we're seeing carryover that's increasing on farm carryover, which means that there's less uh, need for the, the elevator or the, the miller to get out and get the, the wheat. Um, something to watch very carefully as we go into this year. And that's because our stocks to use is expected to decline a little bit, and especially in some particular types. White wheat, hard red spring, or as I found in the West, I think you'd call it dark red spring. Um, th those two particular types, and also durum, anyone here care about durum wheat? Didn't think so, no one, okay. Durham wheat is getting close to what we call the, or my friend Frank Olson from North Dakota State calls the, the welding technique of marketing. Put it in the bin, weld the bin shut, and don't open it until the guy drives onto your farm to buy it. But we're getting close to that point. We'll see what happens as we go on in this year. But white wheat in particular has been showing some strength. In Washington, parts of Washington has been bidding over $5, 5 to 5.10, and bidding about a 90 to a dollar 10 over the Chicago Board of Trade. So white wheat is showing some strength going into this year, although there's, there's some stocks left on farm. Uh, as we go further, there may be marketing opportunities there. Um, hard red spring wheat has shown strength the last several years. As, as it's been contracting, and protein is a big issue right now in the milling industry. Because of the big stocks, uh, the big yields, protein was down a bit, so protein is key going forward. Um, protein will play a big role this year again. So look for those opportunities to market protein if you have protein in wheat. Um, just quickly going to go into a couple other things. Hey, uh, it's, it's been cold in some parts of the country, hot in others. It's been warm in, the, in a lot of the area where we actually produce cow-calf operations. It's been very cold in parts of the country where we feed. We're using a lot of hay this year. And so hay stocks are going to be down a bit. And that might be a, an alternative to look at as you go forward or, uh, for a rotation. Um, Things to, to expect going forward, in more intensive negotiations with landlords. We still need land values to come down some to help alleviate the, the margin pressure we've had. Getting out and talking early with landlords is very important. Um, Break-evens are, are getting to the point where they might be manageable in the future, uh, but be prepared for periods of time when they'll be negative. Our outlook is that we're moving back into a more normal uh, condition where the expectation is really tight to very thin margins on most row crop production. Uh, we see 2019 as being a higher opportunity for uh, production or for, for making a profit uh, because we continue to see slight declines in acreage planted that will help push prices back up a little bit and, and move back into a profitable area. But as you make 
as you make long-term plans, make sure you're building into that the tight scenario, especially as you look at, at equipment across the, the um, acres that you're planting. How much can you do? Our, our, we do analysis of sample farms across the country, and we estimate, uh, particularly in, in potato areas, that there has to be a contraction probably of about 6 to 12 to percent of total equipment debt that we had back in the, in the uh, 2015 and earlier period. Last point there, producers are going to stop farming in this environment. There are some that are already in trouble and won't be able to get out. Um, we see it probably not a huge number, maybe five to 10%. Uh, but if we have additional big production years, it's going to be continually difficult. And it's management that is the key. All right, so very quickly, built to last. I really identify with this fellow. <clears throat> um, he's seen a lot. Like all of us in this room have seen a lot. And people ask me, so what's going to happen? How are we going to get out of this? My answer is, well, farmers will figure a way out. They'll manage their way out. Because that's what we do, we manage. But it's got to be more than the crop now. It's got to be the whole business, the whole enterprise. First of all, understand your financial position. Understand it very thoroughly, what your equity position is. Because now farms have moved beyond using equity for expansion and are starting to use equity just for production. When you invest equity in production, you are gambling your long-term health of your, of your farm. So make sure the investment makes sense. Um, know your cost of production. It's, some don't know the cost of production. Know what the cost of production is all the way down to the cost of storage. How much does it cost me to store for a period of time? Especially if you're talking about wheat and corn. It, nothing makes me sadder than to get a call from a, a, a reporter in August or September saying, do you think it's time that some of those farmers sold the grain they've been holding for a year and a half? And most don't know that they probably spent 50 cents per bushel on storage in just interest rate. So know that cost and know how much it costs to, to move. Um, you have to be able to budget so that liquidity and working capital can manage through these periods. As you look at how much equipment debt you need, calculate one key uh, variable, debt coverage ratio. What does it take for me to cover my debt? to cover my debt payments and interest rates. And once you figure that out, then add on to that a little bit. You should try and run at about 1.1 1.2. That's not an official bank number, that's my number. As I look at, at what the probabilities are of prices moving around. If you're running at, at 1.1 debt coverage ratio, you've got room to manage through some downsides. And that, that's a good long-term budgeting number. Um, understand pricing opportunities and how to take advantage of it. If you're working with wheat, corn, soybeans, anything that's traded, understand your basis. Because basis gives you a great opportunity to market a lot of times, and we don't fully take advantage of those opportunities. Basis gives you the chance to actually price the crop twice if you can do it effectively. Once when you set basis and once when you set price. So if you can understand your basis and how the basis patterns, then that's going to give you, give you an advantage in the market. And there are those opportunities. Also understand where those marketing opportunities are. If you have any kind of volume, there's usually some sort of negotiation for volume available somewhere. If you have access to rail, that gives you even more advantage because you can move that grain to almost anywhere if you know the, the basis and pricing. Finally, because debt has become such an important part 
of, of farming. It always has been, and we manage it that way. But in the past, it's when I was a farm bureau, we used to tell a lot of farmers, don't just get dressed up once in a while to go trick your banker into giving you more money. Get dressed up and go to your banker and talk about what's going on in your business. And frankly, if you don't have a banker that understands it, look for somebody that does. Because you need somebody that understands your business, what you're trying to do, that can work with you to accomplish your goals, not just give you money. Especially if it's somebody wanting to give you high risk money, because that's very expensive. <clears throat> so the next two years are pivotal. Uh, manage through the next two years and the long term, not just the next six months. I think uh, I'm down to just a few minutes, seconds left, but if I can leave anything with you, I, I, the message is, yes, it's difficult, but there is a way through, and the way through it is, uh, is understanding the operation, understanding how it functions, where your market opportunities are, and how to move through. Now, a lot of, it's been described to me before about potatoes. Farming potatoes is like a heavyweight boxer. When you get in the ring as a heavyweight boxer, you know you're gonna get punched. And you're probably gonna get punched often. But if you know how to take the punch, then you're good. You look for chances to counter punch. Okay, that's farming potatoes. Farming wheat, corn, and other commodities as rotation crops, just make sure you don't go bankrupt while you're farming potatoes, farming something else as a rotation crop. And take advantage of those marketing opportunities because they are out there um, to, to give you opportunities. Um, with that, I appreciate the opportunity to be here.